My name is Joshua Landis, and I'm the head of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, and to talk with Hamid Biglari, who um, has really quite an extraordinary past. He came to Cornell University just before the Iranian Revolution, went to Princeton to do his PhD, worked at the, the nuclear plasma f physics lab there for a while, before deciding to get into finance moved over, worked for Citicorp as the vice chairman and head of emerging markets for many years before starting his own venture capitalist firm with some other partners. And, um, and most recently, he's gone back after 35 years to Iran to begin to flesh out whether there are economic opportunities there and to try to bridge the gap between Iran and America. And uh, that's what we'd like to talk about today. Welcome, Hamid. It's great to have you here. Great to be with you, Josh. Tell me, what sparked your, after 35 years, all this work in the economic markets here and in, around the world in emerging markets, what made you think that it was time to go back to Iran? Well, Josh, the reason I got into finance was because of my interest in globalization and uh, how nation states were becoming the were being displaced as the units of international competition and being replaced with uh, companies who were now competing on a global scale. This goes back to uh, 1990 when globalization isn't the buzzword that is this, that it is right now. And so, the role that I had at uh, Citigroup uh, at Citigroup uh, in uh, having responsibility for the emerging markets was really the culmination of that interest and and, and desire. Really until the election of President Rouhani in 2013, I did not think that um, there was a role uh, for people with my background uh, to contribute to uh, anything in, uh, in Iran. Uh, when revolutions happen, uh, it takes a while for that revolutionary zeal to uh, calm down. Uh, and uh, various experiments uh, are done to see what works and what doesn't. I really felt that um, uh, until President Rouhani was elected that there wasn't anyone in a position of uh, leadership in Iran who both had the orientation of taking Iran into a greater level of international engagement with the rest of the world, nor had the political savvy to be able to maneuver the very intricate and complicated domestic political scene. That changed when President Rouhani was elected. I felt that uh, for the first time after 35 years, that possibility had come about. Not that different, although the context is, is uh, uh, two very different societies, not that different in some ways than when Deng Xiaoping took over from Mao Zedong uh, in uh, in China, change happens in these countries only from the inside, not from the outside. And often the person who is responsible for change is someone who is a trusted insider. And Deng Xiaoping was one of Mao's favorites. President Rouhani was an integral part of the Iranian revolution from the get-go. But he has a uh, vision about where Iran should go which involves a lot greater level of interaction with the rest of the world, a much greater level of re uh, economic reform uh, and, uh, uh, and political reform than anything that existed in the past, and being an insider has the, has the ability to do it. That's the reason why I got engaged. Well, let me, let me ask you about the potential of the Iranian economy. What, what's the upside? As investors look at Iran, what's important about Iran? What are the good aspects of Iran before we explore what are the difficulties? So Iran has, to summarize, four things going for it. First, it is the 18th largest economy in the world in terms of uh, purchasing power parity uh, GDP. So the way I like to describe it is, is Iran is the only G20 country that is not a member of the G20. It has, on a PPP basis, a GDP of around $1.4 trillion. Uh, the United States has a GDP of around 17 trillion, so Iran is about 8% the size of uh, U.S. GDP, which makes it a pretty important uh, country, larger than Australia, 
uh, for example, in terms of GDP, comparable to, uh, to Turkey. It has a population of 80 million people. And that is a, f for a country that is not connected with the rest of the world, that is a very large e economy. So it, in some sense, it is the last large emerging market country that has not been connected with the rest of the world. Secondly, Iran is endowed with the largest hydrocarbon reserves of any country in the world if you add both oil and gas. So Iran has the fourth largest oil reserves in the world after uh, Venezuela, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Canada, and it has the largest uh, gas reserves in the world. And so on a com there are very few uh, uh, energy-intensive economies that have that kind of a balance. Uh, with, so that obviously makes it uh, very important. But even more important than that from my point of view is, is, is the quality of its human capital. So Iran has a uh, highly educated young population. And the statistic that I find striking is that Iran puts out 238,000 engineering graduates every year, which is about the number of engineering graduates coming out of the United States. And it's fourth in the world on that basis, fourth or fifth in the world on that basis. The, others, the other countries being India, China, uh, Russia, and the United States. And all of those countries have much larger populations than Iran. So when you adjust it for per capita, the engineering output uh, from uh, graduate schools is enormous. And that's always been important, particularly in light of where the global economy is going into a much more technologically intense uh, period in the 21st century. That is obviously extremely important. Two-thirds of Iran's population is below the age of 35, so it's a young population, and that is very important in terms of its ability to uh, move the economy looking out. Let me, let me stop you right here and, and ask you to compare this to Saudi Arabia. So often Americans look at Iran and this new balancing, in a sense, that, that, that President Obama is trying to achieve between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And a lot of hawks in Washington say, we shouldn't be doing this. We are friends with Saudi Arabia. We have traditionally been friends of the Sunnis and enemies of the Shiites, perhaps not by attention. But since the Iranian Revolution, 79, we're against Hezbollah. We're helping Saudi Arabia and Yemen against the Shiites. We have helped the Shiites in Iraq, but um, we're hurting the Shiites in Syria. What, you know, as we look at the Iran Saudi competition. It sounds like what you're saying is that Iran has got a lot more benefit to the American economy, not only in human capital, but in terms of potential and so forth. What, um, you know, compare those two countries and American interests in each country. So, Josh, if I was being provocative, I would Let's say... Let's be provocative. Why not? I would say that Iran uh, has a, an anti-American regime and a pro-American population, and Saudi Arabia has a pro-American regime and an anti-American population. So if I were to project out and ask myself where would I put my bets down the road, I know where I would be putting my bets in terms of greater level of interaction between the two countries. Now why is that? Why, why are Iranians? We've, we've heard that a lot in the press. Why are Iranians so pro-American? Well, first of all, there's a historic dimension to this, and uh, there's a cultural dimension to it. The historical dimension is that during the 19th and uh, mid-20th century, when two superpowers of the period, Russia and Britain, were competing for influence around uh, the Middle East, and in fact, it is well known now with the benefit of historical uh, archives that the Russians and the Br Brits had divided Iran into three zones. The southern zone was going to be the zone of influence for the Brits, and the northern part was a zone of influence for the Russians. Americans actually played a very important role in terms of uh, the development of Iran's constitutional monarchy. A gentleman by the name of Baskerville fought alongside of Iranian constitutional monarchists. And another uh, American by the name of Schuster was instrumental in 
putting in place the first treasury that Iran has. And these two names are, have not been forgotten in Iran in, in terms of building the foundation of a new Iran. And then throughout the first half of the uh, uh, 20th century, the United States was a very important balancer in preventing the Soviet Union from taking more provin uh, provinces and territory from the north of Iran. And, uh, and uh, as a result of all of these dynamics, Americans had a very large uh, presence in the country, essentially all the way to the, uh, uh, the revolution in 1979. And that cultural foundation really was put in place in the 60s and 70s, where American cars, American music, American film, uh, uh, American literature, all manners of um, soft um, uh, power as well as economic power became ent uh, entrenched I suppose, in Iran. I suppose a result of that is that the cabinet in Iran today has got the most American people who've graduated from American universities of any government in the world. Uh, not only is that uh, true, Josh, but uh, Rouhani's cabinet has more American-educated PhDs than Obama's cabinet has in the United States. So it has even more ed uh, PhD educated, uh, American PhD-educated uh, cabinet members than our own uh, uh, government. So Iran is a good, it, 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 it has tremendous potential. What are some of the difficulties? What are some downsides as American businessmen look at Iran? So there are uh, 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 several major downsides. Uh, the first is that um, uh, Iran is a difficult place in terms of doing business, particularly in terms of the absence of uh, what we would call rule of law in the developed uh, economies. By that I mean things like uh, resolution of business disputes, contractual disputes, uh, a, uh, a, f a f uh, minority investor rights, uh, how long it takes to register property, access to property, transparency of who owns what. Those elements are at a very immature stage in Iran. And by the way, that is not entirely surprising because that is also true for most emerging market uh, countries. The World Bank does a tally of emerging market countries, actually all uh, economies, in terms of ease of doing business. Out of 190 countries that are ranked every year, Iran ranks 118th, uh, and obviously that's low. If you compare it to some other familiar names, not so unusual. So Brazil is ranked 116th, and India is ranked 130th. So according to the World Bank, it is harder to do business in India today than it is to do business in Iran, despite the fact that Iran has been a relatively closed economy. Having said that, there is no question that Iran needs to do a lot more work in terms of uh, rule of law. Secondly, corruption is a major problem, major impediment. Again, that is true across all the emerging market countries. It is absolutely true in the case of Iran. And third, for an economy to lift itself up, capital needs to be protected. So that goes, that goes with rule of law. But also capital needs to be allocated in the most efficient way in terms of the best use of resources in society. Unfortunately, capital allocation, which is typically done by the financial system in Iran, has, is not very efficient today, largely because during the Ahmadinejad period, the banks were used, as is done in many uh, state-controlled societies, as piggy banks for the state. They were directed in terms of where they lend. Rather than lending based on profits and losses, they were directed to lend to state-owned enterprises. And as a result, there's a lot of imbalances that have been created in the Iran's banking system with a lot of large amounts of non-performing loans. So Iran's banks need to be recapitalized, and privatization needs to come in very, to, in very significant terms to... Uh, to, to how to, how to much hostility is there to capitalism amongst the the, the clerics. 
uh, obviously this is one of the parallel struggles that's going on in terms of liberalization, not liberalization. But is there deep hostility to capitalism, or is it not really that deep? You know, Josh, people think of Iran as a monolithic state, the way they think of North Korea, or even the way they think of uh, China, where there's the Communist Party and everyone you know, falls into place. Iran is a autocratic society, but it has elements of democracy built into it that are very different from other places. And in particular, within the context of Iran's political system, you've got really two wings. You've got a reformist wing, let me call it the nation state, that believes in market capitalism, believes in greater economic interaction, believes in competitive market dynamics. Uh, and that is largely represented by the, by the executive branch. Then you've got the hardline or conservative elements represented by the Revolutionary Guards, represented by the judiciary, represented by uh, a majority in parliament uh, that, is, that are deeply suspicious of international engagement, largely because of the history of Iran. And that segment is not a fan of free market capitalism. It believes in state control. And it's a much more conservative, traditional view of what the country's role and the state's role should be. Those two views of the world, those two views of the state, are in constant conflict with each other in Iran. And that is what we're seeing day to day. So far from being a monolithic state, there's really a spectrum of views inside the country, and you have those who believe in progressive, w within the context of Iran, it's not liberal democracy, but it is market forces uh, and uh, com competitive dynamics and engagement, and you have those who fundamentally uh, do not believe that that's the right view. Now that I've got you on Iranian politics, let me ask you a a lot of analysts have said, well, Iran is very particular to the Middle East because it has these democratic elements. It has an elected parliament and a, and a, and a president who is elected, even though it's got this rigid theocratic superstructure. People have compared it to England, 19th century, where England went through a very strict voting franchise according to property and loosened up. The voting franchise is quite strict according to ideological principles and adherence to the th theocracy. Some people say there's room for this to evolve towards a more democratic option, the way England evolved, and not go through the French Revolutionary, the French model, which went from staggering from revolution to revolution. Do you think that Iran can evolve towards a modern, enlightened, government to set up? Or do you think that there's going to take a revolutionary process? So I am firmly in the first camp and not in the second camp. Uh, and I'll give you a few different uh, uh, reasons for that. First of all, uh, as I mentioned, two-thirds of Iran's population is below the age of 35. This group of people are highly educated. They are have great deal of exposure to um, the world. Uh, they are internet savvy, and they do believe in this uh, concept of uh, a modern uh, market-oriented middle class. Obviously, there's a spectrum of opinion there, but largely that is uh, the, the view that it has. And just as you can't negotiate with gravity, you can't negotiate with demography. In 20 years' time, that population that is below the age of 35 will be in control of most of the organs of the country. And so if you take the long view, a 20-year view, I am very optimistic about Iran's evolution and its uh, engagement with the rest of the world. If you take any shorter-term view, I think it's, uh, it's very uncertain. Uh, there, as I mentioned, there are competing powerful camps today inside the country about what, where the country should go. And we don't know which one will succeed. They have different points of view. 
the people obviously, when they voted for Rouhani, they voted for a certain direction. Uh, there's elections coming up with the parliament uh, by the end of this week, and a lot of reformist candidates were prevented from standing for election by the vetting process. Largely, I believe, because it was felt that if they did stand for election, they would win the popular vote. So Iran is a marathon. Anyone who goes to a marathon expecting to see a 100-meter dash is going to be disappointed. If you take the long view, I think Iran will absolutely evolve towards a modern, fully integrated, uh, competitive um, economy. And I think the history is suggestive of that. Iranians are very entrepreneurial. And uh, I think that that is the direction that society will go. But in the short term, we can have you know, uh, setbacks. We can move two steps forward, one step back. And it's unclear. We just need to s feel its way through. And the last comment I would make, Josh, is you made reference to British democracy. Iran will have its own democracy that fits its culture and its history. It, it is unreasonable to expect that Iran will have a liberal democratic tradition the way Western society is developed or the way the United States developed. We can't impose our conception of democracy on countries with 3,000, 4,000-year-old histories. They have to go through their own process and figure out a structure that makes sense for them. Okay, let me switch to oil. Oil has collapsed over the last five months. It's putting tremendous pressure on states like Oklahoma. Everybody here is interested in when prices are going to go back up. And, and to a certain extent, they're looking at Iran. Because here's Iran, sanctions are off. The, it has tremendous capability of producing. It doesn't want to play ball with Saudi Arabia and others who are trying to stabilize production. There's an overhang today in the markets of about 2.5 million barrels a day. Iran said it wants to produce another half a million by the end of the year and a million in not too long time. So Iran's expansioning in an expansionist role, saying we don't have market share, we need to. Iraq in, this, in some ways is in a similar situation, although it's, it, it's increased its output in the last few years. How do you, so Iran is, is, a, is sort of a swing producer here and could make a big difference in the future of oil markets production. How do you see Iran handling this position as it comes back into uh, higher production rates? So I'll give you a few different perspectives on a complicated question. Obviously, no one has a crystal ball, so we can, but we have different uh, uh, ways to look at the problem. First of all, if you look at global supply and demand for oil, there's about an excess of about, about a million barrels per day that is uh, that is that exists okay. today. There's about 98 million of uh, demand, and supply is within a is, is about a million more. And the reason it is it has been uh, growing is obviously because of the shale revolution, primarily in the United States. So, if when you ask the question of who can swing that, uh, there are several elements at play here. First of all, Iraq went from being a war-torn state. To being incredibly, uh, to being increasingly a stable state, and as it becomes more stable, it will produce more. So that dynamic is underway. Saudi Arabia is the largest oil producer in the world, and by definition, it it, it can swing uh, prices at will, as it did when it decided to uh, uh, cap uh, prices um, uh, a couple of years uh, uh, or about a year ago, and it's worth also understanding the motivations behind that decision that has both geopolitical implications with respect to Russia and, uh, the, uh, and Iran, uh, and that rivalry that exists as well as um, uh, just uh, their own market share uh, considerations. The third element is obviously Iran. So if Iran, which, uh, whose oil production was cut by half as a result of the sanctions, um, and its export capacity went from 2.5 million a day to um, slightly more than a million a day, that 1.4 million can obviously have influence in terms of the swing. So there are various factions that can, that can 
that have an impact on that swing that I described. And that's one, uh, one element of it. The second element is what is the production cost of these countries? A barrel of oil in Iran costs about $12 to produce on average. Obviously, it varies from oil field to oil field, but on average, it's 12 for oil. If you include gas, it drops to about $3. So it's very cheap to produce oil in Iran. Saudi Arabia, oil is about uh, uh, $7 a barrel to produce. So even at $30 a barrel or $25 a barrel, these countries in the Middle East, because of their very low um, cost, are able to uh, create, uh, uh, create uh, 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 wealth for themselves. Now, by comparison, shale here in Oklahoma, the break-even point is about $40 a barrel. Some of it, the harder shale, is much more expensive, but a lot of it is around $40. So you're saying that Iran can make a profit, a d decent profit, even at these low prices of $30, $35 a barrel. And um, so we're going to see low prices for some time, you think? First of all, all of the Middle Eastern uh, countries have low uh, production costs, and they can make a profit. But the flip side is they have significant investment needs. And so uh, it is not in their interest for oil prices to be so low <coughs> because they have to take out a lot of their uh, production capacity and get very little in return when, in the case of Iran, the country needs anywhere between half a trillion to a trillion dollars of investment needs for the next 10 years. And in the case of Saudi Arabia, it has a major budget deficit because of its social contract, which is providing huge pressure. Right. Saudi Arabia needs $96 a barrel in order to pay break for even. its budget, to its break-even price. What is Iran's break-even? It's uh, about the same. About the same. Uh, and so uh, all of these now, both of these countries will adjust their budgets to meet right. whatever, you know, their, 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 it means cutting back on investments right. at the end of the day. So that's another uh, dynamic. But uh, Iran badly needs to rebuild its economy. And therefore, uh, the, 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 the fastest way that it can do that is through increasing oil production. It is unlikely to be willing to cut back on that just simply because of its uh, economic needs and the fact that it is coming after many years of sanctions where it hasn't been able to produce. Having said all of that, when you add all of these factors in, global supply and demand, the fact that Iran's technological capability in terms of extracting oil is very low and it's running very inefficient operations that needs to reinvest back in, uh, and competitive dynamics Experts believe that Iran, by 2020, will at most get back to its pre-sanction level of production of about 2.5 million uh, barrels a day. Uh, so even though the country, understandably, has much higher aspirations of getting to that point faster, as you mentioned earlier, it may get to the increase to the tune of half a million barrels a day relatively quickly, but going beyond that is there's going to be significant competitive challenges and technological challenges. So that may take time. Okay, let's switch to security issues. Hanging over Iran is a cloud of demonization for the last, since the Iranian Revolution. The West has been painting Iran as a very ugly country, an aggressive country, a country that supports terrorism. How, um, you know, what do you say to that? How do you... Uh, is that true? Is Iran aggressive country that's destabilizing the Middle East? You know, Josh, we in the West have a tendency to, to impose our one-sided narratives on countries we have uh, problems with. And there is no doubt that we have a lot of grievances with Iran. Our grievances start with the taking of American diplomats hostage in 1970 and 1980. It extends to the Kobar Tower uh, bombings. Uh, uh, it extends to, which was done by elements that were favorable uh, to, uh, to Iranian government, the Shiite elements. It goes to the attacking of the uh, marine barracks in Lebanon, uh, done by Hezbollah. And it extends during the Iraq war to the use of IEDs by Shiite um, 
elements that were sympathetic to, to Iran against U.S. forces. So those are certainly uh, a lot of grievances. But it's worth looking at it from the other side of the coin. So the grievances that Iran has with respect to the United States goes back 60 years to the point where Iran's democratic, first democratically elected prime minister, Mossadegh, who wanted to keep more of Iran's oil wealth to itself rather than it being taken by the British, decided to nationalize Iran's oil, and the CIA mounted a coup to overthrow him and put back the Shah. And, and as a price for that, they got 40 percent of the Iranian uh, oil company, and that turned into BP, British Petroleum. Precisely. And so the re Iran's resentment and grievance against the United States starts with that very important uh, point in history, 1953. Then in uh, the Iran-Iraq War in the 80s, which was a war of attrition where Iran lost a million uh, people, the United States is viewed as having supplied Iraq with military capabilities. There's uh, famous pictures of Don Rumsfeld going and visiting Saddam Hussein and the uh, flow of military uh, to the Iraqis. And most important of all, when Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against Iranian civilians and killed about 100,000 people with chemical weapons, the United States stood by the side and said nothing. So the same red line that we used against uh, Assad in Syria in, in its use of chemical weapons, we were completely silent when the chemical weapons were used by Saddam Hussein against Iran. And Iranians view that as a complete double standard and, hip, uh, and a clear uh, element of uh, hypocrisy. And then lastly, when under a previous Iranian president, Khatami, under George uh, W. Bush, when he unilaterally put a stop to Iran's centrifuge development at a time when Iran only had 190 centrifuges, George W. Bush turned around and referred to Iran as an axis of evil. And so when you look at it from the Iranian perspective, they view the United States as trying to undermine the Iranian ind national independence, national sovereignty, and security for the last 60 years. And so you're saying that America really is responsible for killing a lot more Iranians than Iranians are for killing Americans. It's certainly the perspective that Iranians have, and you know, I'm not taking a, a side in this, but these are different perspectives on the table, and we need to recognize both of these perspectives. So my view is just as it took courage for Kissinger and Nixon to look at China at a time when China was viewed as a mortal enemy of the United States, just as Iran is viewed as an enemy of the United States today, and think about the problem completely differently, about how the world might be different if the United States and China could find areas of cooperation, and how the world has become a much safer place in the intervening 50 years. I believe we are at that same inflection point with respect to Iran, that if we continue to pursue the same failed policies of the last 60 years with respect to the Middle East, instability will continue and we'll always find ourselves on the other side of the fence with respect to Iran. But if we rethink the region in light of Iran's role, Iran, uh, Iran's uh, potential, and how the population dynamics in this region are likely to evolve, and we reorient our policies so that we can find areas of cooperation and the mutual respect comes about between Iran and the United States, that in turn will result in Iran acting more responsibly and being a tool of stability, an agent of stability as instead of an agent of instability today when it feels under siege. That rethink is what we need today. So, so let me... A lot of people in Washington worry that Iran is building a security architecture for itself in the Middle East that stretches the, the, the Shiite Crescent, as King Abdullah of Jordan called it, that stretches from Lebanese Shiites to Syria, bolstering Assad. 
supporting the Shiites in Iraq. Of course, America put them in power and, and cast the Sunnis from the top side down to the bottom. But this Shiite crescent, Iran to Lebanon, new architecture backed by Russia, enabling Russia to get a foothold in this Middle East, chopping the Sunni world, a world stretching from Istanbul to Mecca, that the Arabs have seen as a Sunni world into two. A lot of people in Washington say that's an aggressive thing. This is bad for America. It's bringing Russia into the Middle East. It's going to destabilize the Middle East. Um, is it bad for America? Should we be worried about it? And should we be trying to counter Russia and Iran's ambitions in the greater Middle East? It's a very important question, Josh. There are, the, there are different ways of looking at this problem. The first thing to realize is that alliances are very fragile in the Middle East. That's been true for the last uh, several centuries. And remember that Russia was a hostile state as far as Iran was concerned for most of the last two centuries while the United States was a stabilizing force for Iran until the, really the last uh, 30 uh, to 40 years. And even from a theo theocratic point of view, Iran has more things to quarrel with uh, Russians than they do with, uh, with the United States. You have to ask the question, why is there an alliance? Why is this this alliance between Iran and Russia? Well, it has to do with the fact that we've pushed Iran away from us by viewing it as an enemy to look for other alliances to rebalance itself in the region. Remember that in the Middle East, the balance between Shiites and Sunnis is almost half and half. It's about 45-55. It's not the same as the rest of the world where it's 85% uh, Sunni and 15% Shiite. In the Middle East, it's, it's closer to half and half. And so when you push a country back against the wall, it will look for ways to rebalance the dynamics. That's why I, I believe that we need a fundamental reorientation. People were saying the same thing about communist China in 1980 or 1970 before Nixon and Kissinger came up with a completely different framework for thinking about China in, in, in the world. I think we, also, we need to come to a different framework for how Iran can work with us. So for example, Iran and Afghanistan are, have common interests in a stable Afghanistan. Iran and the United States have common interests in a stable Iraq. Iran and the United States have a common interest in rooting out ISIS as a destabilizing terrorist network in the region. These are all places where we can start working together. And if we have greater economic interdependence with Iran, and we start to look for areas of commonality, we're not going to agree on everything. So let's start with that. If we think that we're going to get to a place where Iran is 100% with us or 100% against us, you're either with us or against us, like George W. Bush says, we'll never get out of this predicament. We need to realize that there are areas that we can agree and areas where, where we disagree. We need to capitalize on areas where we agree in order to rebalance our respective posture. If we do that in an intelligent way, then we, we would find ourselves in a very different Middle the East. The grievances of Shiites throughout the Arab world, they, you know, this is a, once again a, a question of narratives. They say, under the Ottoman Empire, we couldn't serve in the military. We were terribly discriminated against. We were seen. And, and as a result of that, we've been the sort of dirt farmers of the Middle East. We've been very poor and discriminated against, whether it's Lebanese, south of Lebanon, in Yemen, Iraq, or in Syria with the Alawites. They were rural populations, very poor. And in a sense, they looked to Iran to get a leg up as a civil rights, as a leader, in a, if you want to look at it as a civil rights movement, to get equality. And in this war between Shiites and Sunnis that has really destabilized the Middle East, I suppose that's one element of it, is trying to find equality. How do you see this theocratic debate and power struggle? When are we going to see the end of it? When will there be some accommodation between Sunnis and Shiites. And I, I'll add one, 
a recent poll done um, by Pew found that in many countries in the Middle East, like Jordan, Egypt, Sunnis, when asked if Shiites are Muslims, about 40 percent in some of the countries said, no, they're not. When Shiites were asked if Sunnis were Muslims, almost 95 percent said that they were. What explains that difference, and when are we going to get over that difference? Two factors. Neither, uh, they're easy to explain, but difficult to implement. One is education, greater degree of education, and second is the creation of opportunities. Countries and populations react, or ethnic groups react, when they lose hope in terms of creating a, uh, a better world for themselves and their families. And they are easier to manipulate by uh, demagogues because their mindset sees no other alternatives. That's been the history of extremist groups throughout uh, history. Education is a longer-term process, uh, and nothing can be done on short time scale, one can, but one has to start it somehow. But creating opportunities is something that uh, is different. It can be done within a 10 to 20 year time horizon. And ultimately, the way you co-opt segments of the population that feel marginalized or disenfranchised is you find mechanism to empower them and to uh, allow them to be successful for themselves. By the way, Josh, we don't have to go far. The fact that we have the populist movements in the, in, in the United States where there's the 1% and the 99% is just another uh, manifestation of the same fact where the pace of technological development has outpaced the ability of our educational system to create good jobs for the middle class. And so the middle class is disappearing, and you're finding more and more extreme and partisan voices getting louder and louder. That's just another manifestation of a more extreme situation that we see in the Middle East. And so these ethnic and power struggles come about when uh, population groups are marginalized and lose hope. And the only way to address it, by the way, it's equally true for the Palestinians uh, in, in the region. The way you address it is to create opportunities, create incentives. Human beings respond to economic incentives. You provide it to them, they'll respond. Hamid, thank you very much for coming in and talking with us today. My pleasure, Josh.